Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. Okay, so about three quarters of recently discovered new human disease agents are, are viruses versus bacteria. And this is showing you um, some slide, I, um, some pictures of viruses that have emerged probably within most of your lifetimes, the last 20 years, um, to cause some diseases, some of which have um, spread considerably, such as Ebola. So what's similar between all these different viruses, West Nile, Zika, bird flu, SARS, MERS, and Ebola, is that these are RNA viruses, so their genome is made of RNA rather than DNA, and they have an animal host that serves as a reservoir, and it allows introduction of the virus into humans occasionally. Okay, and this shows some of the viruses that we study because they're considered bio-threat agents. Um, either due to natural outbreaks or concern about use as a, a biowarfare agent. And you can see on the side, you have some pictures of animals. These kinds of these animals um, serve as the hosts for the viruses, such as bats for SARS and Ebola. And they cause some serious diseases, uh, such as respiratory um, distress and hemorrhagic fever, and in the case of um, Zika, microcephaly. Okay, and so I threw in a few slides that are um, specific to Nipah virus. This is the virus that's going to be featured in the movie. So the movie has a scenario where somebody gets Nipah virus, and I won't ruin it for you or anything. Um, but um, just so you know what this virus is, this virus is found in fruit bats um, in different parts of Asia. And originally in 1998, there was an outbreak of disease where there were pigs in a Malaysian pig farm that were coughing and were quite sick, and the people who worked with the pigs also became sick and came down with encephalitis. And this was the appearance of Nipah virus. So this was a brand new virus, and it was caused by uh, the growth of large pig farms, um, deforestation, which brought the bats into contact with the pigs. The bats carried the virus, chewed on fruit, that dropped into the pig's sty, the pigs ate it, got it, and gave it to people. So it's a very typical type of emergence where you have changes in the environment, um, often man-made, that spurs the introduction of the virus into the human population. And now it's also prevalent in Bangladesh, where it has actually gone person to person and infects the, um, the, the sap or the, the palm juice, the date juice that they drink, and it gets spread that way as well. So you'll see a little bit of that in the movie. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with what viruses are and how they differ from bacteria, this slide is for you. Um, viruses have either a genome made of DNA, such as ours, or one made of RNA. And the viruses that emerge most often have RNA genomes rather than DNA. And this is because RNA mutates much more quickly and allows the virus to change and adapt to new situations and hosts. But a virus in itself is very simple. It has a genome, or the collection of genes, either in RNA or DNA. It has a protein coat to protect the genome from the environment. And then some viruses bud from the host cell and take the membrane of the host with them and decorate it with their own proteins, um, which allows them to infect very specific cell types. But that's what the picture is there um, on the um, right-hand side. So you can see viruses, little yellow viruses, budding from the cell. Now viruses, unlike bacteria, are completely dependent on the host cells to replicate. So if you have a virus sitting on a countertop, it's not going to be replicating. It's going to be sitting there because there are no living cells for it to invade and replicate in. So it uses the machinery of living cells. And this is showing a typical virus life cycle where you have a little round virus with its um, proteins on the surface that allow it to bind to and enter a susceptible host cell. And then it enters the cell, releases its genome, replicates its genome, makes its proteins to make more genomes and uh, viral particles, and then either buds out or replicates to such an extent that the cell bursts. And so it's a very simple lifestyle, but very successful. 
And so what we're going to be talking about are viruses, um, RNA viruses, that live in populations within hosts. And these populations are diverse populations because the virus mutates. So this is showing an example of that. Um, we have our founder virus, which is the little purple virus on the left, and it has a particular genome, which is um, given an example with the nucleotide letters on the bottom. And as it replicates, the genome changes slightly. So the enzyme it uses to replicate its genome, on average, makes one mistake every time it replicates the genome. So you can imagine these mistakes build up, and pretty soon you have kind of a diverse group of genomes um, that make up the population of viruses within that host. And this is called a quasi-species. So you can see that um, by the time you get more viruses, you have kind of a diverse but related group of viruses living in that host. And some of these new genomes may enable the virus to infect new hosts or spread to new tissues or cause a different type of disease. Okay, so just recently people have been appreciating how this diversity within the, the host is important for the virus's lifestyle. Um, and this was a really interesting experiment that was done about 10 years ago at UCSF, where they were looking at polio virus. And the mouse model they were using was such that when you infected the mouse, maybe by inoculating the leg of the mouse or something, with polio virus, the virus would um, replicate in the body and then spread to the brain and kill the mouse. They found that if you took the virus that was present in the mouse brain out, and you grew it up under different conditions, the type of disease changed. So if you grew that virus up in a condition that did not allow it to make many mistakes, so it was a more clonal population, it had a different disease outcome versus if you had grown it up under natural conditions where a variation was allowed. And so the top picture is showing the little red virus that came from the brain that was grown up to make it more clonal, more homogenous population, and the uh, population underneath that is a more diverse population. And so when you infected mice with the more homogenous clonal population, the virus was not able to cause disease. It couldn't make it to the brain of the mouse and kill the mouse. So even though that was the same genotype that made it to the brain before, if you did have that diversity, it couldn't make it to the brain. And you can see with the second preparation where the virus population was allowed to be diverse, that did make it to the brain and kill the mouse. So it looked like the population was somehow cooperating and allowing the disease to take place. And so this is an important phenomenon we need to understand. And that's what Jonathan and I, and I have been working at um, for the last several years. So this picture here is just an illustration of what a population of viruses might look like. You have the little pink viruses, and those are representing the genotype that does best in that environment. Maybe it grows faster or evades the immune system better, but it is the predominant genotype present in the population. And then you have variants shown here in blue. Now, with different technologies, we've been able to sample the population differently and see the population at different levels of resolution. So here on the left, we have a typical um, sequencing method or, or method for characterizing the virus that was popular in the 90s and 2000s and is still used today because it's very accurate. However, this particular type of test only samples a small part of the population, and so that means you see generally the only the most common sequence present. And we refer to that as the consensus sequence. It's the dominant sequence in the population. Um, in the newer techniques, you can sample more. However, in the newest technology, we can sample a big part of the population and see variants that are present in very low numbers. And this might be important because perhaps one of those variants is allowed or is, enables the virus to evade a vaccine or an antiviral drug or spread in a different way. And so you'd want to know that those rare variants are there if they're going to cause a, um, a different effect of the infection. Okay, and this is giving an idea of what some of the data looks like. So if you look over on the left and you see the classical sequencing technology, the output, um, you could look at different colored peaks and you could just basically say that's G, C, G, and so you could just kind of read across the genome. But it only gave you the most common or most um, prevalent genome present. Sometimes with a little extra work, you can get more information like is shown on the right-hand side. Or in this case, you see the peaks, 
But you can see one, um, one site um, in the genome, there is both a C and a T present, so there's overlapping peaks. So this is telling you, hey, there are two genotypes circulating and they're present at about the same amount. But unless that second genotype is present at, you know, above 20%, you're not going to notice it in the peaks. So you're still missing out on a lot of variation. Um, with the new sequencing, which Jonathan will be describing, you get to look at each position in the genome about 10, 20, 30,000 times. So you can see very rare variants, mutants that are there at very low levels. And if you know that mutation changes the genotype, you can now say, aha, there's something we need to look out for um, in this population. Okay, so now you know about viral genomes, and we're going to have a short presentation on what human genomes um, do and how they are sequenced. You heard of the human genome, the huge collection of genes inside each and every one of your cells. You probably also know that we've sequenced the human genome. But what does that actually mean? How do you sequence someone's genome? Let's back up a bit. What is a genome? Well, a genome is all the genes, plus some extra, that make up an organism. Genes are made up of DNA, and DNA is made up of long paired strands of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Your genome is the code that your cells use to know how to behave. Cells interacting together make tissues. Tissues cooperating with each other make organs. Organs cooperating with each other make an organism. You. So, you are who you are in large part because of your genome. Knowing the sequence of the billions of letters that make up your genome is the goal of genome sequencing. A genome is both really, really big and very, very small. The individual letters of DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, are only 8 or 10 atoms wide, and they're all packed together into a clump, like a ball of yarn. So, to get all that information out of that tiny space, scientists first have to break the long string of DNA down into smaller pieces. Each of these pieces is then separated in space and sequenced individually. But how? It's helpful to remember that DNA binds to other DNA if the sequences are the exact opposite of each other. A's bind to T's, and T's bind to A's. G's bind to C's, and C's to G's. If the A, T, G, C sequence of two pieces of DNA are exact opposites, they stick together. Because the genome pieces are so very small, we need some way to increase the signal we can detect from each of the individual letters. In the most common method, scientists use enzymes to make thousands of copies of each genome piece. So we now have thousands of replicas of each of the genome pieces, all with the same sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's. But we have to read them all somehow. To do this, we need to make a batch of special letters, each with a distinct color. A mixture of these special colored letters and enzymes are then added to the genome we're trying to read. At each spot on the genome, one of the special letters binds to its opposite letter. So we now have a double-stranded piece of DNA with a colorful spot at each letter. Scientists then take pictures of each snippet of genome. Seeing the order of the colors allows us to read the sequence. The sequences of each of these millions of pieces of DNA are stitched together using computer programs to create a complete sequence of the entire genome. This isn't the only way to read the letter sequences of pieces of DNA, but it's one of the most common. Of course, just reading the letters in the genome doesn't tell us much. It's kind of like looking through a book written in a language you don't speak. You can recognize all the letters, but still have no idea what's going on. So the next step is to decipher what the sequence means. So that gives you kind of an introduction to the actual process of genomic sequencing. And I'm a computer scientist by training, and 
reason why this is sort of interesting to me is because this, uh, this type of new sequencing technology is generating a lot of data that's actually become really impossible for a human individual to sort of sort through and understand without actually having the aid of, of a computer program. So I want to kind of just sort of step through a little bit more about the sequencing technology because it's really an exciting time for sequencing technology and things are really changing very rapidly right now and have an opportunity to have a big impact on uh, really human health as, as we move forward. Um, so to sort of kind of give a sort of a broader perspective here, there's really sort of these three different categories of sequencing technology that have kind of emerged Starting with the first uh, Sanger sequencing, which has really been the bedrock of sequencing for the previous 40 years. And it was the technology that was used to sequence the first human genome. Um, it took ultimately you know, an, a team of international scientists and, and, and billions of dollars to accomplish that task, um, but it was, it was ultimately possible. Um, but in around 2005 was sort of the introduction of this new type of sequencing, which encompassed many different types of technologies. So it was ultimately sort of called this uh, dubbed the next generation sequencing. And that started in about 2005. And that's the type of sequencing that we're using right now to interrogate virus, viruses uh, and viral evolution. And I'll talk more about that. But also there's a whole suite of new sequencing technologies that are, taking, uh, that are being developed right now. Uh, we, we might call them future generation, but they're just coming into the, coming, becoming available to scientists uh, right now. And, and they're starting to already have an impact. Um, but they're still a little bit more in the experimental phase and aren't being used in commercial applications. So just to highlight sort of the key kind of technological advance that sort of enabled this current wave of sequencing technology, it's this uh, glass-like device that's called a flow cell that allows you to actually spot those millions to billions of short genetic fragments all fitting on a single glass slide so that it allows you to process many uh, biological samples and recover uh, many different or millions to billions of gen genetic fragments simultaneously uh, in the space of I would say about a 24 hour time frame time span. To put this sort of another way is to kind of look at what the cost is take it takes to sequence an individual human genome sequence and that's really what has been traditionally driving a lot of the sequencing technology. Uh, starting way back at the introduction of the first human genome, if you were to do it with the state of the art at that time, it would take on the order of about $100 million to sequence an individual single genome. And what we're seeing is this is what, we, on a log scale, the, uh, the, the cost to sequence an individual genome has dropped dramatically in recent years. And this, where the arrow is pointing, is really at this point of that technology change, or the introduction of that flow cell which has dramatically uh, changed the ability to sequence many more ge genetic fragments simultaneously. And where, where we are right now is really getting close to this point of the thousand dollar genome, which can be sequenced by an individual technician, um, it, and is really kind of where the, uh, getting to the point where it's sort of commercially feasible to sequence individual genomes for medical applications. So I like to think, as a, as a computing person, I kind of like to think about these sequencing technologies and these different categories analogous to computing technology. So on, on the left here, I have sort of what is kind of akin to the uh, supercomputers that we have at the lab, uh, which are sort of your large machines that can sequence lots of human genomes. Uh, so there's a, there's a, a sequencing uh, type of uh, technology that can sequence on the order of about 50 human genomes uh, per day, and that's about a $10 million machine right now. Uh, and I kind of think that is sort of like your current supercomputer. Uh, there's, the, there's desktop or benchtop sequencers, which can sequence on the order of about a human genome in a day, and they're still pricey on the order of uh, $250,000 to purchase one, um, but they're becoming they're much more accessible to the average academic research lab. And then there's this, what I would call the sort of the future generation sequencing technologies, which are on the order of sort of akin to a tablet because they're mobile sequencers. 
They're sequencing devices that actually uh, are sort of the size of a USB drive and you can actually pipette a biological sample onto a mobile device and it's something that can actually allow you to do some sort of sequencing analysis in a more fielded, a uh, field forward kind of situation. But the uh, pa sequencing power of those is still somewhat limited so that you're actually only able to sequence on the order of a bacterial genome in a day, not in a whole human genome, which is considerably larger. <clears throat> now, I get a little bit excited about these kinds of sequencing technologies and think about how much, you know, progress we've made in the last 10 years, but it's kind of important, it's useful to maybe have some historical perspective to think about where are we actually in the spectrum of development right now. And uh, since I would say that, you know, commercial applications of sequencing technology are only, uh, are sort of on the, uh, I would say about on the order of about 10 years old, I kind of think that we're actually really closer to the, uh, akin to where we were historically with computing technology right now. So things are changing so rapidly right now, I think that it's going to be a very exciting for the next 20 years to see how uh, cheap and easy it is to do sequencing uh, of ourselves and the uh, bacterial and microbial world around us, and it could very well change. So switching this back now to taking this back to viral, studying viral evolution, you know, even though the technology, a lot of it is being driven by this idea of everybody being able to have their genome sequenced and have your medical insurance pay for it, that same technology can actually, can still be applied for studying viral evolution. So the ability, so the ability to sequence a single human genome is roughly equivalent to the ability to sequence 600,000 individual viral genomes because they're so much smaller. Um, a typical viral RNA virus genome is on the, might be on the order of 10,000 nucleotides uh, rather than 3 billion, so uh, it's a dramatic difference. So as Monica mentioned before, traditional sequencing, um, you can only do with the Sanger sequencing that drove the original sequencing of the human genome, you can only capture on the order of 100 fragments, hundreds of genetic fragments in a day's worth of work. And so in that process, what you end up seeing is just sort of this homogenous view of the genetic population of the viral uh, community um, that you're studying. And so that's sort of what this is showing right here. This is a, sort of a, another view of this sort of historical view of what a viral infection might look like. It's just a uniform population of viruses. So with next generation sequencing, um, we're capturing on the order of up to 100 million genetic fragments, you know, in a work uh, work procedure that might take uh, on the order of three days to, to generate that data. And so what you have, each of those genetic fragments is actually a random sampling from that population. So the view becomes, this is how we come to this view of this much more rich and diverse uh, picture of what the actual viral population looks like. And this is sort of what we refer to as deep sequencing of a viral population. And the reason, again, to under, underscore the importance of this is this idea or this hypothesis that the entire, the, the ability for that virus to adapt to new circumstances, respond to a new viral, antiviral drug or infect a new host, um, the hypothesis is that the mutations are contained within that population. And if we can actually see them and identify them at low levels um, in, say, a host animal environment first, it will give us the opportunity to predict how that virus is going to respond in a new environment. And so that's one of the kind of key important uh, hopes of applying this new technology to better uh, anticipate what the virus is going to do. Now, from a, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a computer scientist, so there's, there's a kind of a interesting computational problems around how, in, how you actually process this data and make use of it in a way that can ultimately lead to some sort of improved bi uh, biological understanding. So on the left side is sort of showing this idealized view of the viral population. And what we would hope to have is an individual genome that's associated with each virus in that, uh, in that population that you're studying from a particular sample. Unfortunately, what we actually have is what's on the right side, which is this short genetic fragments that are snapshots of different parts of the genome from different viruses and we actually have a very hard time knowing which of these fragments belong to which viral genomes. 
Um, so this is actually right now still technically an unsolved problem. Uh, we kind of can view, can view these fragments as puzzle pieces, and one of the challenges is that we have is how best to piece these puzzles uh, pieces together to reconstruct that full genome for every virus in the population. So to get around that problem, uh, we sort of sidestep the, the ultimate goal of re reconstructing every genome and come up with something that we call a mutant spectrum of, uh, of variants that are present in that population. And so what I'm showing here is sort of this general process here. What we start with is one consensus reference genome that we think is a good representative of uh, viral genomes in the population. And then we take each one of those genetic fragments and match them to the reference and orient them to see where they belong. And uh, we end up with this sort of genetic uh, matrix, as I think of it is, that shows on the going across different positions in the genome and going down to different possible variants that are in that population. So this is sort of showing uh, one example where the dominant is cytosine, and we're looking at every uh, individual fragment and we're counting to see are there other alternatives that are being observed. Uh, and so in this case, we, when we kind of do some, um, uh, so this is where we get into some sort of technical tricks to try and distinguish how many, how many fragments do we need to see before we believe that there's an actual true genetic variant in that population. And the reason why this is tricky is because the sequencers themselves are noisy and generate some errors, as well as the fact that we have to distinguish that from the natural mutations that are occurring. And so we have to come up with some statistics to actually come up to, to make a prediction about what we think is a true uh, genetic variant call. But what we end up with is essentially this process of going base by base, fragment by fragment, and looking for genetic mutations in the population that we think are actually there. And this is a process that can take on the order of uh, three to four hours on a fairly expensive single computer, I'd say on the order of like a, say a ten or ten thousand dollar machine. Um, but, you, but this can potentially grow to be a fairly computationally expensive process as you start to look at many more samples, uh, ideally 40, tens to ultimately hundreds of samples. So here is just an actual example of what a, a mutant spectrum looks like uh, in a sort of visually on a real uh, case here. So on the x-axis here is showing uh, places in the genome, positions in the genome, and the y-axis is showing the relative frequencies of different mutations that are observed uh, in the population. And this is showing two different populations. One is the population of a virus that's been grown in the laboratory, starting with a single clone that was isolated from a natural population, taken uh, from a natural host. And so I just put it to you to, to think initially, which one do you think is the natural population and which one is the laboratory population? The one is in yellow and one is in blue. So, um, it's act so in this case, it's the, the yellow triangle clone is the laboratory population. And you can see that there's a distinct difference between the two. The, vir the natural population has a much richer diversity of genetic variants in the population, whereas the clone has only started to accumulate a small number of mutations because it's only had a limited amount of time to evolve in the laboratory setting. Now, traditionally, uh, growing these types of viruses in the lab would have not actually even observed that there was any evolution taking place at all. So the conventional sort of view would have been that the laboratory clone would have stayed uh, sort of homogenous and not have any generic, genetic variants. But now we can see with this new sequencing technology that even on very short evolutionary time frames, the laboratory strain is evolving and accumulating mutations, but still hasn't had enough time to evolve to uh, develop the kind of rich mutant variability that's observed in the natural host. And so with that, I'll pass it back to Monica to talk about how we're using this on an actual uh, outbreak example. Okay, so if you're a infectious disease fan like I am, a science nerd that loves epidemics and looking at them, this is the exciting part of the talk. No offense, Tom. <laughs> um, okay, so we're talking about a rabies virus outbreak. Um, so rabies virus is an RNA virus 
that lives in reservoirs such as bats or skunks. And when a rabid animal bites another animal, whether it's a person or a fox or whatever, it passes the virus on to that individual. Now, does anybody know if rabies causes serious disease? Yes? So, does it kill people? Yeah? Like, what percent of people die once they have symptoms? About 100%, yes, everybody. So if you get bit by a rabid animal, you don't realize it and you don't get treatment, there's shots to treat you if you are exposed, then you are almost 100% sure that you will die. Um, and that's what makes this the most deadly disease out there. Now, in the United States, we have vaccines for our pets, so we don't see that many cases in the United States. However, in the developing world, you get between 55,000 and 59,000 cases of uh, deaths from rabies every year. So it is a, a, a global problem still. All right, so in the United States, we have bat rabies, but we also have rabies carried by different terrestrial mammals, such as skunks, foxes, and raccoons. And there are different genetic variants of rabies in different hosts in different locations. So a skunk in Montana is going to carry a different variant or genetic type of rabies than a skunk in California. And so if somebody comes down with rabies, and oftentimes by the time you get to a doctor with symptoms, it's made it obviously to your brain and you may not be very coherent, they may not be able to tell you where they encountered an animal or if they did. So when the person passes away, they take a bit of the virus from the person's brain material, sequence it, and we can say, oh, that's a sequence of a raccoon in, you know, in New York. What are they visiting New York? So, so it's that specific according to host and geographic location. Okay, so the, the outbreak I'm going to be talking about occurred in 2009 in Humboldt County, California. So I have a friend at California Department of Health, Sharon Messenger, who loves rabies and understanding their outbreaks. So she's a rabies evolutionary scientist. And she told me that there was an outbreak of skunk, skunk rabies that seemed to have jumped to the fox population, and now you're having foxes coming out of the woodwork attacking people and their pets. And that's what this map is showing on the left. It's showing the Humboldt, um, Eureka, Arcata area where the outbreak took place. The black dots are animal encounters. The red dots are animal encounters where the animal was killed and the rabies was um, isolated from its brain. So um, it was a pretty big outbreak. The foxes, when they're rabid, get much more aggressive than the skunks do. And they're actually attacking people, chasing them down, attacking their pets, jumping through car windows, stalking people in their you know, apartments. Just very, a very noticeable event. Um, and if you look at the chart here on the right, you can see the number of rabies cases that happen in each year and whether they're associated with skunks or foxes. And you can see in the 90s, it's much more typical where you have skunks and some fox cases. Now you notice the fox cases more because they're more aggressive than the skunks when they're rabid. Um, so you always have some skunks that pass the rabies under the fox. The fox attacks a person or a pet, but it doesn't go among the fox population. Now in 2003, you can see there's an uptick in number of fox cases. Then it drops down because often in rabies outbreaks, the rabies kills the animals, so it kills the animals that are affected. The population is so low that the outbreak can't continue, and then you have to wait till that population of susceptible animals build, and then you have another outbreak. So you see these dips. But in 2007, 2008, you see that uptick again, and in 2009, you see an amazing number of animals, a 355% increase in the number of rabbit foxes. And as I mentioned, it was a definite, noticeable event there. Okay, so what we got from Sharon, we got samples of brain tissue from various animals from the 2009 outbreak, the 2003 uh, time period, as well as the mid-90s where there wasn't an outbreak. And we sequenced those and looked to see how the virus changed. And so we um, generated a lot of data. We sequenced 45 different samples, and as Jonathan mentioned, that created tons of data, which a biologist cannot process. We now work with bioinformaticists to make sense of the data. Um, so we work as interdisciplinary teams to um, look and figure out how the outbreak unfolded. 
Okay, and so this is um, a phylogenetic tree, and I'm showing you this because this is how we look at the data. Once we've made sense of the data, we want to organize it in a way to see how the different viruses are related to each other. And that's what these phylogenetic trees do. So they're similar to family trees, where on the branches you see A, B, C, D, E. These are the individual genomes that you're looking at. So they might be skunks or foxes. And you can see there on the left, there is a genotype, you know, the A, T, C, G, a sequence associated with each different individual on the tree. And those with similar sequences, such as A and B, are in cluster close together. As the, set, as the sequencing becomes more distinct, you now get um, F, G, H, so you get them clustering, clustering farther apart. So the closer they are together on the tree, the more genetically related they are. Okay, and also, we get, as I mentioned, tons of data on the nucleotides, but because it's an RNA virus and it mutates quite a bit, we have lots of mutations present, and we've got to figure out which mutations are the important ones that might cause the change that we see. And so we tend to focus on mutations that change the amino acid sequence, because the amino acids make up the proteins, and the proteins function to give the viruses characteristics, whether it can infect skunks or foxes or, um, you know, infect different types of tissues and so on. So we look at changes in the genome that affect the amino acid sequence, and then we have look very deep within the population, about 30,000 X coverage with the deep sequencing data. Now, um, I also work with, a computer, work with a computer scientist who takes these mutations on the proteins and places them on a model of what the protein looks like and sees how those might interact with host proteins. And that's what this is showing you here. And the reason it's up there is because I think they have something like this in the um, movie. So that's what this is, is they're looking at protein structures and they're placing the mutations on the proteins. Now, there is a local connection to MEPA right here in the... Um, Bay Area, Tri-Valley area, and that is an individual named Oscar Negrete. Now Oscar um, works at Sandia in Livermore, and when he was doing his PhD work, he was working on MEPA virus. And I knew Oscar before I met him because I had read his paper. What he did for his, um, his PhD was to discover the host protein that the MEPA virus uses to enter cells, so the receptor. So I just want to mention that um, we have greatness in our midst. Um, um, we have scientists here that make great discoveries, and one happens to be related to uh, EPA. Okay, so back to rabies. So when I start a, um, a research project, what I usually do is I have a hypothesis, and I have a vision of what the data will look like. You know, what, how do I expect things to fall out? Well, I'm expecting the, the fox genomes to be slightly different than the skunk genomes, to group together, fox, fox, skunk to skunk, and also group according to year. Um, and it's always kind of amusing because usually when I picture what my data is going to look like, I'm totally wrong. And then I have to kind of sit there and scratch my head and be disappointed and, and then rethink and try to figure out what the data is actually telling me. And that's what um, I'm showing you here is the actual data. Now we have the fox sequences shown in yellow and the skunks shown in white. And you can see by the years on the left-hand side that the isolates fall out, the samples fall out according to year. We expected to see that. Um, so we have some samples from 1995 and 2003 and then the 2009 samples. But we saw, what we saw were the foxes and the skunk samples were intermixed. So you're not seeing a branch, it's just foxes. Um, what you're seeing are clusters according to ge geographic locations on the map. And actually, um, there was a much larger northern cluster. There's about 20 more foxes in that northern cluster that I couldn't fit on this graph. But you're seeing them cluster according to north and to south and according to year. And now that was a surprise. Um, you see, um, because we had not expected to see that. However, when we looked at the outbreak, and I actually went through old newspaper articles to see, or were there really that many more fox attacks in the north? What we saw was there were mostly fox attacks in the north. There was one or two skunks there. But what you saw was most of the fox-to-fox -fox transmission appeared to be going on in the north. 
So it wasn't the outbreak as a whole, it was this particular part of the outbreak that had Fox to Fox transmission. And there were actually changes in the amino acid that were associated with that transmission that fell right to that part of the um, phylogram. You can see those arrows there. Those are changes in the um, glycoprotein on the surface that were associated with the outbreak samples. Okay, so that is data from consensus. We're not looking at the deep sequencing data yet. So we looked at the deep sequencing data. It gave us another dimension on the outbreak. What we saw was the cases in 1995 were associated with a particular genotype, and that's shown in blue here. However, the pink genotype, the little pink viruses, are those that were represented in the 2009, as it turned out, mostly in 2003 as well. So that's the outbreak genotype. And if you look at the population from the 1995 samples, you will see that ancestral blue genotype, but you will also see at very low levels the outbreak genotype being present. It was there already in 1995. By 2003, it was selected for, and by 2009, we've had a couple changes and it became a big explosive outbreak. And in the 2009 and the 2003 samples, there were remnants of the 1995 genotype still present. And so what that's telling us is if you look at old samples, you get, might get a hint of what's coming up. And if you knew what those changes in the new genotype meant, you might be able to say, we're in for an outbreak. If you look at modern samples, you may find remnants of historical genotypes present. And this is good for forensic studies. And this is um, the second to last slide you'll be relieved to hear. And basically what this is showing us is how this data really gives us granularity on the outbreak. If you look on the right side of the screen, you see some, some positions from the 1995 samples. These are amino acid. Um, changes that are associated with the genotype from 1995. So if you look at site 308 in the genome, 99% of the genomes have a leucine there, but about 1% has a phenyl element there. Now if you look over to the 2003 samples, that same site 308, you now see phenylalanine at 99% and a trace of leucine, maybe 1%. And we saw that at several sites where it was a flip, an inversion. What was dominant in 1995 became a minority where you have to look deeply to find the presence there in 2003 and 2009. And on flip, in 1995, you see a hint of the outbreak genotype present by using deep sequencing data. And so in this way, the deep sequencing data gave us higher resolution. So if you guys have good TVs, high resolution is important to see clearly. And that's what the deep sequencing allows us to do. So how do we predict what new viruses pose a risk? So we're getting new viruses, a few new viruses every year. And some of them become like Zika, where they do crazy things and catch us off guard and cause outbreaks, large outbreaks. But some don't do anything. They go back and stay mostly in the animal population. So we need to be able to develop techniques that allow us to predict if a particular virus is a threat and so we can um, prepare. And that's what the deep sequencing is about. Um, okay, so the deep sequencing gives us um, detailed information on how the viruses are evolving and help us develop predictive capabilities. Okay, and these are the people who did a lot of the work there. Um, Jonathan has some help in bioinformatics from Hyman and Clinton. And in virology and molecular biology, I got help from Gilda Mona and Victoria. And then at the health department, Sharon Messenger and Doug, Deborah Watford um, provided us with samples and gave us some insight into the um, historical um, aspects of rabies. Okay, and now we're ready for questions. Thank you guys for your attention. And what's really interesting about rabies is even though it's an ancient disease, they don't understand the dynamics very well. So actually what happened in 2009 is it, it died off from that area. But that same year there was a case, the first human case um, in that area, in Trinity County, where they actually had a human case. 
and unbelievably that little girl survived. So, so it dies out, it goes someplace, um, but it stays in the um, reservoir house. So with um, rabies, um, there is a technique that they've used maybe in three cases where these had a good outcome, called the Milwaukee technique. They put the person in a coma and hope that that person's immune system can be beat off the virus, but it um, is not a proven technique. And so, no, it's the supportive care of making the person comfortable for the most part. But, but I would add, sort of, in the, uh, in the realm of HIV, this has been uh, one area that's been pioneered in terms of identifying a more complex uh, spectrum. If you can identify rare variants in an HIV population, that can help with guiding for predicting resistance to this particular drug treatment. Yeah, and they actually use deep sequencing now for um, diagnosing HIV and what drugs might be useful. Uh, so it's, it helps guide what you would predict, that, yeah, which would be the, the type of vaccine that you want to try and put out for the next year. So yeah, it's being used heavily for, for that. So there's one thing that is a huge part of this type of um, research that isn't appreciated, and that's the basic science. So I mentioned that rabies is an ancient disease. In order to understand what a mutation might mean, you have to know that virus well. You need to know what a mutation does in terms of how the virus acts. And so when I looked at rabies data, there was very little information on telling me that mutation at 308, what's that going to mean? They don't know. So you have to have the laboratory work making these, what they call um, infectious clones, synthesizing the genome and just putting that single mutation in the genome and looking at how it changed and how the virus acts. So behind all of this computation of sequencing technology, you have to have people in the lab understanding the basic science of the virus. And you have to do that for many different groups of viruses because they all behave a little bit differently. So yeah, that's the research. That's what the research comes in. It's important. And just to add to that, but I think the key point is, assuming that you understand the meaning of the mutation, the hypothesis is that if you see that mutation at a low level in the population, it's more likely for that particular variant to be uh, the responder to a new environment as opposed to some new mutation that has never been seen before to have uh, arisen sort of spontaneously. So it, there's a better, there's sort of an improved opportunity to improve the accuracy of the prediction, although it's still just a prediction problem. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we've looked at about uh, four or five different types of viruses now. And what we've seen consistently is that you don't have the virus jump to a new host and then all of a sudden a brand new genotype arises. It's usually there in the background and it's selected for. So if you were exposed to an animal you have any slight reason to believe is, rabies, is rabid, um, then they would try to capture that animal and quarantine it and see if it was rabid. But they also, whether or not they caught the animal, would probably give you some shots which are no longer delivered to the abdomen, and I guess they're just normal shots, which give you a rabies vaccine, as well as they may give you antibodies against the virus. And with rabies, when it enters the body, it goes into the nerves, and it takes a while from that rabies for that, for that virus to travel all the way up to the brain. And so that buys you a little bit of time to use these treatments. By the time it's in the brain, there really isn't any treatment. Uh, this has been fascinating. Like, thank you. And but now I have a better understanding how cancer treatments can be so targeted. And it always amazed me that you could find your host site of cancer is not necessarily where it's discovered first. 
and by tracing back the different cell types and all this wonderful information, then they can go to the host site and actually be treated and have good results, better results than in the past. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually very interesting to uh, uh, consider the parallels between viral evolution and cancer evolution. And there's mm -hmm. certainly a lot of work in that area. There's a lot of parallels. That, that was a great question. That was a really great question. question. Well, in order to um, continue with the program, I would like to um, just move on.